So what I'm going to do at this point in time is say hello, everyone, and welcome back to Refresh. This is a time to connect, be inspired, to learn something new, and ultimately feel a bit better about ourselves. Always up for that. And this time we spent together. So how is everybody? It's October. And you know, October, among many things, is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And believe it or not, breast cancer is the most common cancer in the world. I was surprised to read that. One in eight women will be touched by the disease, which undoubtedly, right, connects all of us to its impact. Like you, I have several dear friends right now who are thrivers, a term that we have embraced, especially at the V Foundation for Cancer Research, a foundation that I am so proud to serve upon as a board member. Sherry Levin is our producer. And for those of you who tune in regularly, you'll always hear me say, Sherry, do you have this? You have that? Whatever it is. She is a breast cancer thriver. And she sent along this program welcome for us today. And before I read her notes, I just want to thank Ariel for stepping in. Thanks, Ariel. So this from Sherry Levin. Hello. I'm sorry to be missing one of my favorite parts of my job as producer for Refresh. Yes, I too enjoyed this time to connect, be inspired, and ultimately feel a bit better about the time spent together. Our guests always fill my cup with joy and pages of motivational moments. Ironically, as we recognize Breast Cancer Awareness Month with Dr. Alad, Olad I did this so many times, Oladaru, I, can, I cannot be the producer today because my scheduled six month visit with my oncologist at Dana Farber Institute in Boston. In 2014, my breast cancer diagnosis came up after a routine mammogram, a call back, then a biopsy. I never expected to hear those words. I am sorry you have cancer. Breast cancer does not run in my family and I was an active and healthy person. I'm now happy to say that I'm a breast cancer thriver of nine years. It's been a hard journey of healing and as a survivor, it's always in the back of my mind. It is still the love and support of family, friends, and my medical team who not only aided me in my physical healing, but also lifted my spirits in the most challenging of times. I'm grateful for my care and the unwavering presence of those who gave me strength. This is a journey I never could have gone through without drawing on that support, even today, as I write this note. Thank you, Dr. Aladaro, for your dedication to research. If I could share any advice with our audience, our refreshment community, it would be to embrace all of life's beauty, cherish each moment, and schedule your routine checkups. Oh, and register for, for a fresh. Thank you, Sherry, ever the producer. We appreciate that. We cannot be more grateful to the Mayo Clinic and our special guest today, a superstar doc who has been determined to be an active contributor to the world since she was a young girl. And we'll talk a little bit about her journey to the work she does today as a radiation oncologist at the Mayo Clinic with an expertise in breast cancer treatments who and she passionately works to deliver personalized care. She treats you like family. And it's interesting, Dr. Lola, and that's what we're gonna call her, is Dr. Lola, because that's what her patients call her. That's exactly what Sherry referenced in her remarks. It was feeling like family that really helped elevate her. Dr. Lola has a focused commitment to prioritizing both physical and emotional well-being. But that's not all Dr. Lola does. Aside from her clinical practice, she devotes her time to pioneering research in radiation oncology, has a commitment to equal healthcare access for underserved populations, particularly incarcerated women who are at a high risk of breast cancer. Most likely we have all known somebody who's gone through breast cancer or knows somebody who knows somebody. I know many people. And once to be sure, we lessen our odds of getting it if we can. So hopefully we'll talk a little bit about prevention today as well. Welcome, Dr. Lola. And remember, all of you are part of this conversation. So please don't be shy. Post your questions. We'll get to them here and on Facebook. So Dr. Lola. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today and meet all of you and be part of this wonderful community. Well, uh, honestly, you probably are, uh, after this, you're going to be at the center of our community. You, your passion. Before we get right in, tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are. Um, so I was born and raised in Nigeria. And at the age of 10, my family uh, migrated to the U.S. We specifically um, relocated to the Bronx, New York. Um, and so, you know, coming from Nigeria, 
and where I grew up, which was more of an underserved community and quite similar to what we faced in um, the Bronx as well. And just seeing what was around me that looked like socioeconomic disadvantages um, and how that impacts health. I had a passion for science and math and very early on through school, participated in after school programs, um, summer camps on science. And through this NIH program that started in middle school, actually, um, I started doing um, what we at that time was just simple experiments in labs at Temple University in Philadelphia every summer. And that's how I got exposed to cancer research by the time I was in high school over my summers. And they also incorporated shadowing physicians. Um, I do not come from a family of physicians. I'm the first physician um, in my family and from my, actually where I'm specifically from, um, my hometown. And this was a great opportunity, one, to just be exposed to medicine, this long to know about an eight summer um, long program. And by the time I got to college, I was very set on studying biology. I had advisors um, and mentors assigned to me and wanted to pursue both biomedical research and medicine, but I wasn't sure whether to go the MD route or the PhD route. So I took a year off. And during that year off, um, I spent time in Nigeria, where I'd been away from for a very long time. And during that time, I was working on health-related projects for pregnant women. So I kind of got into, I was very set on going to medical school at that point and thinking I would go into maternal health and ob -GYN. And while in medical school, my assigned um, advisor in my first year asked me to shadow her in the operating room on a cervical cancer case. And with cervical cancer, we do a procedure called brachytherapy as radiation oncologist. So while in the operating room, there was a radiation oncologist. Um, actually, she now practices in Israel. So it's funny well, that, um, <laughs> yes, yeah, she does. Um, she now practices in Israel. She was the uh, vice chair of the department at Stony Brook then, and then left and retired after 20 years and now practices in Israel. But this wonderful person took a chance on my life and completely transformed my trajectory. So while I was in the operating room shadowing an ob -GYN mentor, she asked who I was, what I was doing, and invited me to shadow her in her clinic. Up until that point, I had never heard of the word radiation oncology. It's not part of your medical school rotations. It's one of the best kept secrets in medicine is what I say. And so I discovered it so early through the opportunity to shadow her. And I would just spend any free afternoon just spending time with her in clinic. And what I really loved was the time she had to connect with patients. And that's one of the beauties of oncology. You meet people at different stages and walks of life. It's not a rushed setting, um, you know, kind of like a primary care visit might feel rushed. But this one, you can spend an hour plus talking to patients trying to understand their psychosocial needs, how this is impacting their life. And radiation oncology specifically lets you treat head to toe. You can treat any cancer, you can use it for palliative um, treatment or definitive curative intent as well. And so very early on by my third year of medical school, I had made up my mind to go into radiation oncology. Um, even despite all the hurdles of not even having a residency program, I was able to match um, and do my training at Dana-Farber, MGH, and Brigham's combined program in Boston. And that's how I got to where I am. Um, okay, that is, that is beyond remarkable. There's so many things to, to point out. One is the power of mentorship, yeah. right? The openness of these doctors to bring you in, to allow you shadow, to give you exposure and experience to help shape your life is just incredible. It's the work that we do with Generation Wow, honestly, opening up you know, professional women's lives to younger girls so they can see further. I also love um, the kind of beautifulness that Sherry's at Dana-Farber right now, and that's kind of where you came from, right? So there's kind of a pretty circle there. Um, radiate, when you said there's no um, program, no residence program, still for radiation oncologists today, there's no program? In At the time at my medical school, there was no residency program. And so to get into radiation oncology, you had to go to other medical schools 
to shadow and do an away rotation is what we call it. Um, but now my medical school does now have a residency program and there are several residency programs across the country. But at the time in my own particular medical school, we did not have a residency program. So I did away rotations and at those away rotations, I obtained letters of recommendation from people who served as sponsors um, about my ability to thrive in this field. And that's how I matched into the field. And so I, you know, I believe in the power of mentorship and also the power of sponsorship as well um, for women. Right. And before we go on to talk specifically about breast cancer and the trends you see today, Arielle, our fearless producer today, was doing a little re research. I, I wish we would have pulled that photograph, Arielle, and found a beautiful photograph of you as a young college student selected by Glamour as one of the top 10 college women in the country. I mean, it's easy to understand now that you told your story about why they did that. But tell us a little bit more about that. What was it about you at that time that they wanted to talk about? So I was very, I felt very honored um, because I later learned that several prominent women um, while they were college students have received similar awards, but they picked 10 women around the country every year in college um, that they believe have successful futures ahead of them. And um, at the time, the biggest story was that I had gone back to Nigeria and secured a community service grant and made a commitment through the Clinton Global Initiative to build a library in my village in Nigeria. And so that's what was going on at the time. I secured funding to build a library, um, to furnish it with books donated, and also with computers as well. Wow, that's incredible. So here you are. How long have you been in Jacksonville, Florida? Um, now going to three years. Well, in Florida, three years. In Jacksonville, about a year. Well, welcome to Jacksonville, because as everybody knows, our program emanates out of Jacksonville, although we're seen around the world. Tonight, I'm coming to you uh, from Israel, of all places. Again, another connection that we didn't anticipate for this evening. What are you seeing in the field of breast cancer? As much as it's the world's most prevalent cancer or the most right prevalent cancer, we're hearing a lot of great news about curative rates. Yes, yes, and that is true we're detecting and catching things very early. So even before it becomes invasive, we're catching um, cancers or precursors to cancer called in situ carcinomas much earlier with uh, mammograms starting at much younger ages than historically, um, what they used to be at age 50, now age 40. We're also, um, we see an increased uptake in awareness throughout the country about the need for this as you know, everyone now knows someone who knows someone who may have been diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, women are living longer as survivors and thrivers. And so there's been an increase in survivorship. And then overall, there's been significant breakthrough in pharmaceutical space with new drugs, targeted compounds, immunotherapy, and we're moving the needle further and further even with clinical trials on vaccines for breast cancer. And so there's so much happening at the same time that's very hopeful. Likewise, what we're seeing is that our modalities are changing. So for example, in um, radiation oncology, historically we would treat patients over several number of weeks. But today I routinely use five days of radiation for early stage breast cancer in, uh, patients. So. Um, Patients come in surprised when they find out, oh, I don't have to do five or six weeks of radiation. And I'm like, no, just one week is enough. It doesn't mean you're getting less radiation. It just means we our technology has evolved to a place whereby we can deliver higher doses per treatment and confidently know that it's safe, it has less side effects, and it does not compromise oncologic outcomes. So what does that exactly mean in, in um, when you talk about radiation, what exactly is happening to our bodies and why is that a treatment? So radiation, you can imagine getting a chest x-ray. You don't see it, you don't see the rays, you don't feel it and you're not radioactive. So these are high dose radiation that's targeted towards a particular area in the body. And so the radiation involves 
very detailed planning that's driven by CT simulation, uh, CT scan we obtain at the beginning of your treatment. The treatment plan is designed and customized to the individual's body and to the targeted area. Um, it's delivered typically over a number of days, so we don't just give the entire dose in one treatment. It's ten it tends to be split up evenly into a number of days, um, and it's usually during the, the daytime, so between 7 a.m. and 5 p.m., those types of hours. It's very short in duration, so you're on a table, usually in a room where they're playing your favorite music, and the machine is called the linear accelerator, and that's where the radiation is coming out of. Um, radiation, what it's actually doing is it's damaging the DNA of cells. For cancer cells, once their DNA is damaged, it cannot be repaired and therefore it dies. So radiation is used to target microscopic disease that may be left behind after breast cancer surgery. It can also be used to target gross disease, meaning even in patients who never had surgery. So in lung cancer, that's early stage, we do use high doses of radiation to ablate the tumor completely. Um, radiation is very effective in also symptom management for patients with metastatic disease, experiencing bone pain or have um, soft tissue metastases. We do give radiation to help relieve their symptoms. Wow. It, so let me ask you this. On one hand, we're getting better curative rates, and you mentioned that. On the other, more people are getting breast cancer. Why is that? What's, what's, is it in our environment? Is it in our food? How do we as women, and I know you'll talk about men having breast cancer as well, but not anywhere near the same rates. How do we begin to protect ourselves? It's at this point, most likely multifactorial. As we all know, breast cancer does not discriminate. There are societal factors, environmental factors, our food systems changing. Um, environmental exposures are, are changing, um, and also we are catching them earlier. So when you have a lot of populations getting more mammograms, then it's definitely reasonable that we will pick up a lot more things um, at much earlier and uh, earlier and curable stages. So like I said, DCIS can be picked up earlier, invasive cancers can be picked up earlier with the increase um, in screening awareness and cancer prevention campaigns that are going around. Um, so the, this is probably what's contributing to what we see as increase in number of people being diagnosed every year. But we also cannot ignore that um, environmentally and just in general, um, our bodies are changing and evolving and our environment might also be contributing to some of what we're seeing today. So we talked today, we're talking about the power of knowing and there's, and so you're talking about early detection, all of the ways we can, how we can find, um, I guess, become aware earlier of any kind of symptomology. Tell us a little bit more about that if you could. So, you know, early detection does save lives. Um, a lot of campaigns are emphasizing this. It's important to be informed about practicing regular self breast, uh, breast self exams scheduling your routine mammograms. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, we saw that a lot of people had to skip or forget um, their scheduled mammograms. You know, they had to balance the risk of catching the virus um, if they were to go out um, and, you know, moving it to the next year or just completely forgetting it. And that unfortunately has also contributed to locally advanced and later stage diagnosis that we've noticed since the pandemic. It's also important to understand the warning signs. Um, and this helps you stand a better chance of detecting um, the disease in its early stages. You know, one of the things that we're learning today um, is about pregnancy associated breast cancer, for instance, whereby some women um, may notice skin changes that may look like mastitis or infection, but it's actually a sign, could, it could be a sign of breast cancer and requires immediate attention. Um, early stages also uh, decreases treatment outcome, um, improves treatment outcomes. So early stage detection dramatically improves the treatment outcome. If it's stage one, has a much better chance of survival and um, long-term outcomes versus it being diagnosed, for instance, at stage three. And also 
early stage detection will probably reduce the intensity of the intervention. So with the use of tools like the Oncotype GX score, not every woman is getting chemotherapy. And so getting um, an earlier stage diagnosis might also reduce the length of your treatment and the intensity of the interventions that we're giving. And this overall will dramatically increase survival rates. Wow. Okay. Um, you talk about empowerment through education and, and uh, uh, Ariel, you can take that graphic down now. Thank you. Um, talk to us a little bit about that. What kind of education should we be seeking, giving, sharing? Yes. Yeah, so one of the um, things that we've noticed in clinic, a lot of women get their information on the internet and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it has a large source of information but it's always important to verify the information that you're getting with your provider. And people's experiences are different. For example, a friend may have had radiation in the past and had six weeks of radiation. And if I tell you that you are only going to recommend one week, it doesn't mean that's a wrong recommendation. It just shows that treatments have evolved, even in a short period of time, um, changes do happen in our treatment recommendations and protocols. So I always recommend going to nccn, nccn.org, excuse me, nccn.org, which has the more up-to-date scientifically based um, treatment recommendations for any cancer you could possibly imagine. It's, on, it's listed on that website. Um, empowerment through education also highlights the fact that we have individuals in our communities who may not be aware or able to get the same access that we all have. So imagine a homeless woman or homeless individual who is not aware of cancer screening and is not being screened because their primary focus is on shelter and housing security. We have incarcerated people who may have been incarcerated for over 20, 20 years and have no idea that screening guidelines have shifted to starting at a much younger age. And so they're probably unaware that they're eligible for screening or should be screened while incarcerated because their risk factors don't change respective of the walls where they find themselves. We also have an increase you know, in people in populations who identify as being transgender and taking hormones can increase your risk of breast cancer as well. So these individuals need to be aware that they also should be screened for breast cancer. So dispelling myths, it helps reduce fear through understanding. We can encourage open conversation amongst all populations and individuals about breast cancer um, knowledge. Um, and this can help people make better informed decisions about their health, their health. As loved ones, we can encourage our family members. We can reach out to communities for support um, and more accurate information and resources on breast cancer prevention. That's great. I mean, we have our first question from Rosie. Thank you, Rosie. And again, anybody here, this is your chance to ask directly this remarkable doctor questions that you may have. Ha you may have. Rosie wants to know, what can we do to prevent reoccurrence of breast cancer? So, excuse me, one of the first um, things to know is that typically after surgery, we will either recommend some adjuvant, what that means after surgery therapies, this could be chemotherapy, it could be radiation, it could also be endocrine therapy. So the, 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 hold on, hold on, what's endocrine therapy? Okay. Endocrine therapy is usually recommended for women who have estrogen positive breast cancer. So hormone receptor positive breast cancer. Endocrine therapy is essentially an, an anti-estrogen pill that's given to women to help reduce the risk of recurrence of breast cancer. Endocrine therapy works on the whole body. And so women may report side effects similar to being um, in menopause. So hot flashes, bone pains, um, aches, joint aches, and things like that. So hormone therapy is recommended for at least five years for women who have um, early stage curable um, breast cancer. And the purpose is to reduce the risk of recurrence. Um, and I know that this drug can be very difficult to be compliant with given its side effect, but that is one way 
of ensuring that you keep a recurrence, you know, far away from you. Second thing is not going to follow up or, you know, routinely scheduled imaging. So mm -hmm. after the breast cancer treatment, it doesn't stop there. You still need to continue your mammograms because recurrences can happen in the breast that has been treated, radiated, or even had surgery excised from. Recurrences can happen in those areas. Self-awareness, doing self-exams on your breast and also checking your armpit as well. Feeling for any palpable lumps or bumps under the armpit that could suggest lymph node um, recurrences is also important, important as well. Thank you, Rosie. I hope that helps. Yes. Okay. I'm just going to take it. If you have anything, just pop it right in and we'll, we'll take it further for you. So Dr. Lola, you have spent, you spent a lot of your time, um, thinking about and working on behalf, doing research on health equity. You mentioned it. Um, you talked about, you saw that when you were in the Bronx, Right, that seemed to be a motivator. Going back to your village in Nigeria, that seemed to be a motivation. What are you working on now? And I know the Mayo Clinic has recently opened a urban center, if you will. Tell us a little bit more about that initiative. Yes. Yeah, so, um, what I'm currently working on is reaching populations that are overlooked um, and populations that still have poor outcomes. And when I speak of overlooked populations, I'll just give a brief summary of why incarcerated population should be considered as part of our global community. In the US, we have 25% of the world's incarcerated population and approximately 2 million people in the US are incarcerated in prisons and jails at any given time. Most are in there for nonviolent crimes. You've also seen an increase in the number of women being incarcerated. And it's a cycle of revolving doors. They come from communities that tend to be disadvantaged, poor, they already had poor health going into prison and they come back into our communities just in and out like a cycle of revolving doors. And in this population, which has historically not really been studied, what we found is that they are at a high risk of cancer mortality. So they're less likely to be screened. And when they come out of prison, they're more likely to be diagnosed with stage three and four cancers. Um, in fact, in the first year post-release from, from prison, that's the highest um, risk period for an incarcerated person because they're focused on getting housing, shelter, jobs, food, that they are not really getting any health care once they're released from prison and then solely, soonly succumb to um, to death from cancer-related illness. And every year there's a report on what's the leading cause of death in prison. Historically, it was heart disease. Now it's cancer. So what's happening in our community is happening in the walls of prison. And also interestingly, what cancers are also increasing in the prison population are similar to the ones that we're worried about in the community. Colorectal cancer is rising in this population as well. And so they, they are forgotten, yes, you know, for the societal reasons for which they're in there and criminal reasons that, that they, for which they're in there, but we are spending money on them. Your taxes are keeping them there. And so how are these, um, how are these expenses um, made? How are they budgeted? Because if someone gets care at later stages of diagnosis it tends to be more expensive than earlier stage of diagnosis. And so those are things to consider from a health equity standpoint and also just from a cost effectiveness standpoint. Likewise, I am also intrigued and disturbed by the outcomes of Black women who are diagnosed with breast cancer. And so some of my research specifically on triple negative breast cancer has been driven by this. What we see in Black women is that they're twice as likely to be diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer and 40%, 41% more likely to be diagnosed with inflammatory breast cancer. Those are two very aggressive subtypes of breast cancer and we still are not really clear about why. Um, likewise, they're 40% more like, um, like I said, more likely to die from breast cancer. And we think it's because one, they have biologically aggressive tumor subtypes that may be explained by genetic factors 
at the same time, it's also because their diagnosis is coming at a more advanced stage. And there, it has, there's been shown that they have limited access to treatment options. And so even though we're making strides overall and making sure women are keeping up with mammograms and screening, we also see that not everyone enjoys the same outcomes that we see among survivors. Um, and so there's a lot of work that needs to be done um, in that area. That's an extraordinary percentage, 41% higher. Yes, yes. Yeah, and we don't know that. Is there, are, are we seeing a move to dedicate more research dollars yes. to getting better why that is happening? Yes, a lot of work is going into genetic um, um, examination of these reasons. A lot of work is going into social determinants of health. A lot of work is also going into early prevention and detection. So even if they were to present with triple negative breast cancer, it would be far more better to present with that at stage one versus stage three. And so overall, there's so much work that needs to be done from all angles. Community engagement is also a very big one. And that's why the work that Mayo is doing is in the community is outstanding. So they have a community hub within the community of Jacksonville which has a very large socially disadvantaged um, community base and to bring information to them rather than them coming to us, we're bringing the information to them. We're bringing information to them about clinical trials. We're bringing information to them about prevention and screening and talking about some of the myths that they may have that could be informed by historical reasons um, and fears that they may have about being enrolled in a clinical trial so we can understand why this is happening. Um, yes, yes. I, I, and I'm jumping in here. Take a second. I just We should tell everyone Dr. Lola's been sick. Yesterday, she could not speak. Today, we hear her speaking from her heart, and we appreciate that. And I feel like Generation W will definitely send you two tubs of matzo ball soup, chicken soup after this, so you can get better. But I will say um, the clinical trial piece is always... Um, fascinated me. So for all of us, uh, clinical trials, even including women in general, right? Medicine is yes. not really clinical trials. We have been over medicated and overdosed for, you know, up until maybe 15 years ago. Now we're talking about clinical trials and breast cancer with such a high incidence for women of color. Um, there's a real need for women of color to participate in clinical trials. And yet, as you point out, there is fear, there's suspicion, right? There's a lack of trust, perhaps, in some of these cases, right, to, to point to participate. So mm -hmm. there becomes this vicious circle of not being able to improve outcomes, correct? Right, not exactly, exactly. We can't know how to fix this if we don't have accurate representation of everyone on our trials. Because right. otherwise we'll assume these drugs are working effectively across all bodies, but not all bodies are the same. Correct. So without our collective participation, and thank you, Ashley Pratt, for helping make this happen in this conversation. And I know how strongly you feel about these community conversations. We can't make everyone collectively better. Mm -hmm. And it's great that we know that. It's great we're stepping out. So the outreach needs to be important. Yes. Um, Janine has a question for us. Breast cancer clinics seem to have great environments to make women feel welcome, just like Dr. Lola's clinic, warmth uh, and whole person care. Do you think other types of cancer clinics could benefit from this because she called it vibes? Uh, this discrepancy was brought up to me by a female suffering from lymphoma. I guess not getting that same kind of loving vibe that perhaps breast cancer clinics are now really actively focusing on. Yes. And um this is, this is true, um, and the truth is there has been a lot of emphasis, a lot of campaign, women-driven, um, to bringing awareness, to address the issue, you know, wear pink, October, everything, and um, to make our cancer clinics for women and breast cancer specifically more homely, um, more tender and loving and caring um, and holistically supportive. And I do agree that all clinics um, could benefit from this. I will say though, at Mayo Clinic, all of our clinic spaces look the same. Um, and so 
even though it could feel a little bit more personalized with our breast clinics, overall, all of our cancer clinics, even the rooms, the exam rooms, um, all look the same and feel the same. So we have comfortable couches for patients and their families, and not just an exam table in the room, for example. Um, so our spaces do matter, can be inviting, or it could be deterring. So I, I do agree with that, that holistically, it would help across the board for all hospitals to provide this same environment for patients. Um, thank you, Janine, for that question. I have to say that uh, I had a dear friend, but she's still around, thankfully, and she's doing well, who had um, a serious bout of breast cancer. And one of the things she shared to me was, people don't know what to say. She said, I, I think I want to do a book to tell people want to, I mean, they're well intended, but even if they're well intentions would have them say things that were not helpful and but she felt not appropriate. She had what she called the pink room where people sent her so many pink things. She just had to store them away. So I wonder that, you know, the diagnosis happens. It's a friend of yours. How do we support them? What are the right words, language, sayings, and actions that can provide a really positive, supportive environment. Yes, so the first thing I would recommend is to read the room. Um, and that's what I do when I walk into the room. I get a sense of, you know, the room, how are the emotions, people positioned, um, do they look stiff? Do they want to talk about it? If they don't want to talk about it, um, I tend to always ask first about their emotional well-being and how they're coping with the illness, even though they're seeing me after surgery. Um, it's still important to ask that and not assume since they've had surgery, they're all fine because they could still be crying every night worrying about if it's going to come back or if it's still there. And so I, I do think it's important to read the room. The, fir the first thing is also to just be um, mindful of the choice of words, too what type of words and languages would you want to hear? So um, if people put things with the language of war, oh, you'll defeat this, you'll overcome this, you'll fight this, it's a battle. Some people don't like that and do not like those choice of words. Um, and if you're the type of person that tends to be more hopeful or things you say come up from a place of faith or being faith-based, I do ask my patients if, where do they draw their strength? So as a friend, you could identify where does your friend that's been diagnosed draw their strength. If they draw their strength from positive words and positive affirmations, you can share that with them on a day-to-day -day basis, maybe not every day, but once every other day. Hey, I'm thinking of you. Though the times may be rough, there's light at the end of the tunnel. So maybe they like words of affirmation. Um, as opposed to sending them pink things or asking them, oh, do you want to participate in that 5K run together? They may not want to do that. Um, they may not want to be in a support group because they don't want to be reminded of their cancer. Sometimes it's just being there and not saying anything. Um, I want to make dinner for you. Do you mind if I come over? And if they don't talk about the cancer and they don't want to bring it up, don't ask about it. If they just want someone to go to the movies together during their cancer treatment, hey, do you just want to take a break after your treatment and we'll just go out for ice cream? I tell my patient, get ice cream after the radiation treatment, treat yourself. Um, and so if they're from a place of faith, even with my patients, if they identify to me that, you know, they draw their strength from God or that they're a Christian, I may share some scriptural verses with them um, and, you know, encourage them with words from their faith. So these are things that I, I don't hesitate doing. And I would recommend if you're in a position where you can be an encourager to read the room, identify where they draw their strength and use that um, as a way of reaching out to them. That's really extraordinarily helpful. I just ask anyone if they have any comments or any additional questions. What are you most hopeful for now? And I'm just going to give you a little, uh, just a little story here. I mentioned that I sit on a, a cancer research board, and um, and cancer could be really scary and it could be very off-putting, right? People don't want to go near it. And we started this uh, seminar. It's called Answers for Cancer. And I went to the first one, and there was like maybe 30 people. Now there's hundreds and hundreds of people who come that the idea of doing what you're doing for us today, which is providing education,
communication, teaching us about early detection, telling us how we can care about others and more broadly think about that. It actually gives us a sense of community purpose and focus in a space that impacts us all. So I thank you for that. Um, so what are you most hopeful moving forward in your work and for all of us as it relates to your particular work in cancer research in general? Thank you. Um, I'm most hopeful that we're going to see more survivors and thrivers. I'm also very hopeful just sitting from my angle as a physician and a researcher that we're de-intensifying our treatments and that we're appropriately recommending things and we're being more precise and tailored in our approach rather than, for example, giving every woman chemotherapy, we're making better informed decisions about systemic treatment. We're also moving the needle for all women. You know, before we had barely anything to give someone with triple negative breast cancer after radiation, um, now we can give them immunotherapy. So we're investing more resources and talent in identifying new targets for things that historically used to be you know, what we thought was a dead sentence. But now we can ensure that women live longer. And more importantly, what I'm very hopeful for is that we can give women back the quality of life that they deserve and that they've enjoyed. Um, and so that to me overall um, is very exciting for the future that cancer doesn't have to be a death sentence for everyone but rather it could become something like a chronic disease that you overcome and you move back and you, you move on back to your life. Is that what we're seeing with women who have metastatic breast cancer? Is yes. it now become a chronic disease as opposed to something more fatal? Yes, so, you know, with um, oligometastatic disease, we've even refined our term of metastatic disease and identified women who may present with a metastatic lesion or up to five metastatic lesions, but we still treat them with a curative intent. Whereby, you know, less than 10 years ago, if they presented with that many metastatic sites, we would have said, well, there's no role for surgery. There's no role for definitive radiation. We would just put you on chemotherapy for as long as possible. Now we're rethinking how people present and we're being hopeful and curative in our approach to keeping them alive. Okay, and that's really important. Oh my goodness, let me, the change of language is so hopeful there. Perrin Rubin says, aside from self-exams and regular screenings, do you have any recommendations about things that can be done each day with respect mm -hmm. to diet and exercise to prevent breast cancer? Yes, um, you know, a Mediterranean diet is always highlighted as a very good choice, a very good default if you're ever in doubt. But diet, you know, um, watching what we eat, the source from what we eat, there are lots of changes in where we source our food and what we're exposed to. Um, organic food, of course, is great, but we also recognize that there are food deserts in our communities and organic food is expensive. Um, but less likely probably to have hormones, injections, antibiotics, um, sprayed um, things sprayed on our fruits. Just be more vigilant and be more careful. Um, exercise for sure is highly encouraged to all women, even those that are going through breast cancer and after breast cancer has been shown to actually increase outcomes. In fact, there was a recent study that showed that those who did um, stick to a good diet and exercise during treatment, they seem to have better outcomes than those who did not during treatment. And so I do strongly encourage women to stay up to date with making sure that they're checking their cholesterol, they're seeing their primary care physicians, and also being mindful of their quality of life and you know, staying active as much as you can. Staying active. I love that. You're definitely staying active, not feeling at the top of your game, but you are at the top of the game, Dr. Lola. There's no doubt about it. I just took a couple of notes here. Uh, first, let me say hello to Michael Levin. He's on Facebook. Hi, Michael. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks for your questions. They're really helpful. Um, I, I, I did yours in pink. I didn't have a pink shirt, but I have a pink pen, okay? Thank you. Early saves lives, right? So we have to take the time and be a good friend and remind your friends to take the time. 
to try to make sure that they are well and getting the kind of testing that they need to be ensuring that they're staying up on their own medical care. Uh, I saw Bridget just put this up on, thanks Bridge for putting it up on our Zoomcast, nccn.org is a great site um, to that note gives us a lot of information on cancer treatments. The importance of dispelling myths, promoting open conversations. I love this idea of asking people who have gotten a diagnosis, where do you draw your strength? Mm-hmm. And lastly, I'm gonna, uh, and, and the whole idea of community, as you say, we are moving the needle for all women. So let's help you continue to do that by encouraging people who can be part of um, testing. That's really important so that we can continue to get the kind of data that we can then build on to continue to embrace all women. Dr. Lola, I, I thank you so much. Hang with us for a second. I just want to let everybody uh-huh. know that coming up on November 1st, we'll be back again for some more refreshment. Ah, some graphics that she's going to call up, I guess, here. Huh. We're going to we're gonna spend some time with the amazing Judge People's Waters. She's been on our wow stage for our girls, and I'm going to tell you that um, I'm hoping you'll let us use some of this for our wow girls, Dr. Lola. She inspires us to never give up on our dreams. She made history in 2020 as the very first elect, elected Black female court judge in Duval County, Florida. But that only happened because she refused to take no for an answer. And I think this is much as a listen in persistence and not taking no for an answer because 17 times she was denied the opportunity to serve in her life's mission, which is in the judiciary for our state. So she's an amazing woman filled with energy, has great stories. Uh, Remember to register for her amazing journey on November 1st. Also, we're still looking if anyone's interested in for mentors in both Orlando and Jacksonville. We'll be in Jacksonville with Generation Wow, which is a wow experience on October 19th and on November 7th, right here in Jacksonville. And I just want to let people know if you're involved in the health field, our girls, 25 to 35 percent of our wow girls have expressed interest in serving in the medical industry. So they would love to meet you. They'd love to meet all of you. As you heard today from Dr. Lola, how much somebody putting a hand on her shoulder and guiding her lawn made a difference in her life. And lastly, save the date for Generation W. This year, our theme is believe. What do you believe? What do we all believe? What should we believe? How do we believe? It's going to be an amazing day. Follow us November 1st, November 7th, April 5th. We'll see you on November 1st, we hope. Take care, Dr. Lola. Thank Ashley you. Pratt. Thank you so Thank much. You That's so much. Is, okay, that chicken soup is coming by your office. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Be well, everyone. Everyone be well. Take Thank care. you.